Well, we are in a, a series called Not Wrong, Just Different. How you guys do last week? You, you kind of hang in there, everything all right? You didn't get killed or anything? Yeah, well, that's because, you know, those last week are really not very threatening. You know, they're, I mean, physically, we understand we're different, right? I mean, aesthetically and, you know, with all of the, uh, the makeup that we have, and I'm not talking about, like, putting makeup on my be the way we're made, the way God made us. And we discussed a little bit last week about the fact that God did this on purpose. And he did do it on purpose, and he told us, let me just uh, see if I can get that past. Yeah, just look, here it is. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, created him male and female. He created them, which tells us that there are two genders of humanity on the earth. I, I know nowadays it's not like cool to talk about two genders of human being because now we're, we're encouraged to believe that there are more than two. However, according to the Bible, there are only two. They're male and female. And God created males to be masculine and females to be feminine. In other words, he created them differently on purpose. God did not intend for men to be like women and women to be like men. Women are not just long-haired men. They do not have the same drives, desires, feelings, goals, communication, all these things that you saw last week and this week. Uh, God did it on purpose so that our lives could be blessed. You know what God wants for us? to be the best that we can possibly be. And what does that to us is this, uh, this opportunity to experience the strengths of each other. Pastor Tanya and I have been married for 41 years. And I know some of you in here have been married longer than that. And that's a wonderful thing. But I can tell you that in the 41 years that we've been married, there have been lots of changes in both of us. Uh, Tanya is a very administrative person. She's a very uh, planned and organized person. Uh, she likes to cross the T and dot the I. Uh, I, on the other hand, uh, fly by the seat of my pants and, uh, <laughs> and I'm very spontaneous about most things in life. Um, and this causes all kinds of issues in our marriage. Uh, none of them have been fatal or, or terrible because uh, we understand each other and we understand what the Lord's doing. But I can tell you what has happened over the years. I am a better person now than I ever could have been by myself. I have developed into a, a, a better person, a more organized person, a person that appreciates and can follow rules and know that there are certain patterns that have to be done and it works better when those patterns are applied. And all. I still don't really like to apply them myself, but... But I can live under these patterns, and so I have become a much more structured person, and I see a lot of uh, asset in being planned and organized. And, and so the Lord has changed the way I uh, live life and has made me a better person. And yet on the other hand, Pastor Tanya has become much more spontaneous, and she's learned to enjoy life a little better by just being a little looser and let, you know, let the rules kind of you know, move away a little bit. And we can do some things that aren't going to break up the whole universe here. And, uh, and so she's learned to be a little looser and enjoy life. And so both of us have become better people together than we ever would have been by ourselves. Now, if you ask me, you say, Pastor, uh, if, if I'm looking for someone to, to marry or to be, be my mate, for the rest of my life, what am I looking for? Well, you're looking for somebody that encourages you to be better. That it makes it easier for you to follow God when you're with them. Amen. That it just, they, just, they just lead you in the right directions and the right ways and your life becomes brighter and bigger and more wholesome and more complete when you're with them. I think that's what God intends for our mates to be. And when he puts us together and in the passages of Scripture that you hear at all the weddings that you've probably ever been in, you've heard that God has put you together and now you have become one flesh. And what God has joined together, not let not man put asunder. You know, you hear something like that. And all that basically is saying to you is that God draws you together on purpose so that the strengths of you can balance the weaknesses of the other, and the strengths of the other can balance your weaknesses. And I hear some of you saying, I don't have any. Well, <laughs> just come right on up to the altar right now because we're going to have to pray that spirit of lying off of you because you, right now you, you, you just, you're deceiving yourself. 
Because we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. And in the designs of men and women, there are strengths in each, in each side and there are weaknesses in each side. There are some natural strengths with women and there are some natural strengths with men. There are some natural weaknesses with women and natural weaknesses with men. And so God designed us to work together and that's why I call this not wrong, just different because it is different and God did it on purpose and God wants us to use that to our advantage and it is not intended to cause friction and fights and confusion. It is intended to complement each other and to work together so that we become greater in every area of our life. However, if you don't know what these differences are, uh, it can turn into battle royal in your own home and life simply because you are two unique genders of humanity that God has created differently. One, last week we looked at the physical differences, uh, and of course these are, not, uh, these are not hard to see. Biologically we're different. Yeah, we have X and Y chromosomes, so no matter whether you want to become the opposite sex, you're not really going to become the opposite sex. You can mutilate yourself, you can disfigure yourself, you can do all of this kind of stuff, but you're still a man if you were born a man, because every single cell in your body is an XY chromosome. And if you're a woman, you're going to stay a woman. Now, you, you know what the word woman means, by the way? I didn't say this last week, but I'm, I'm sure you've heard them before. And I, Billy, <laughs> Billy tried to encourage me to tell that little story about when Adam saw uh, Eve, he said, whoa, man, you know, and that's, that's how woman, yeah, that's why, yeah, I thought I did say it, but, but, but that's not really, that's not really what, what, what that's not really the reason. The reason, the reason when he said, he said, uh, she shall be called woman because she has been taken from man. Uh, she, she shall be called man with a womb. That's what woman means, yeah. a man with a womb. So unless you can have a womb, you can't be a womb man. You can't be a woman. So you can do a lot of things, but I'm not sure you're going to develop a womb anytime soon. And you're going to have XX chromosomes, ladies. I don't care what you do to your body. Your body's filled with XX chromosomes, and they'll always be filled. So you'll always be a woman, no matter what you call yourself. So anyway, that point, uh, God did differently. Uh, muscular strength, stamina, all those kind of things, God, God created differently. Then we're different. We looked at last week in the area of romantic response. Basically, men are microwaves and women are crockpots, right? That's kind of that's what we learned last week, all right? And um, we need to recognize this, and there are ways that all, both of us respond well to romantic issues. And we are both really created to be romantic creatures. We both desire uh, interaction with each other. That's how God designed us, and God made it that way, and he made it so powerful, so powerful, that it would override everything in our lives because had God not done that, there wouldn't be very many people on this earth because we are so different and we enjoy different things and we, you know, we have certain traits and characteristics that blend. Uh, I, I'm just interested that when God got ready for Adam to have a partner, he didn't create him a golfing buddy <laughs> or a fishing partner. He created a brand new creature suited in every way and then put in us a powerful attraction to each other that would override everything in life so that the command be fruitful and, 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 and replenish the earth would be carried out. You know, that has to be a very powerful thing. But, but in the area of romance, and, and I do have some, I know some of you tried to get this sheet last week. It's the... Um, I don't, I don't, I won't, it's not an X-rated version of anything, but it is, uh, it is, it does talk about sexuality in the, on the sheet, and it's something that I didn't feel like I could do with the whole congregation, but I did feel like you needed to know this in the area of response. So if you're a husband, wife, and you didn't get one of these, and you will promise to read it out loud together and do the little test, it's a little test, a little true-false test, but you need every bit of that information there because um, it's really important. It really is a vital thing in the life of romantic response. So if you'll do that, that'll be great. All right, let's move on today, all right? Here's another difference between men and women. Yeah, let me get this thing to do. There we go. We're different in the way we think and feel. Generally speaking, God designed men to see the big picture. Women, on the other hand, are designed... Uh, to catch the details that have been missed by men. Uh, men, you go to the mirror in the morning, you're ready to go. 
You look in the mirror, you make a few little adjustments here and there. Hey, phew, great. Start walking out the door, and your wife stops you and says, hey, wait, wait, wait a minute, hon. And she comes over there and picks a little tiny piece of lint off of you. Uh, the reason for this is because, men, you looked at the big picture, and you decided, hey, hey everything's fine. And, and, and your, wife, your wife saw the details and saw that there was something there that needed, to, you know, a little attention on the thing. Yeah, a little tweaking. And, uh, and so you could say it this way, that men are headlines and women are fine print. And you see this every time you really talk to each other about things like, well, like your day. How was your day today? You come home from work, one of you or the other, or both of you at the same time. And the question is from the wife, hey, hon, how was your day? And what's his answer? Fine. <laughs> Headline, fine. That's it. That's, it. That's, a, that's just it. That's, it's just fine. You know, he's going to give you the 12-second version of it. Well, it was fine. Well, and, then, and then you begin to, inter- I mean, you begin to uh, talk to him. You begin to question him about it and ask some questions because you're interested in the details. I mean, you want, you want the article under the headline. You know, how was it fine? And what, the, and, 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 and what do you mean by fine? Uh, yeah, fine, <laughs> fine what? And so, and so God created us to work together. Uh, so that these differences that we have would actually complement us and, and not take us down. And I wrote in your notes that you must learn these differences or else uh, wedlock turns to headlock and headlock turns to deadlock, you know, and, and, we, and we end up with some real issues in, in, in life. We have, to, we, have to, we have to learn how to, how, to, how to look at each other and recognize that we think differently about things and we feel differently about things. Because we think differently, it makes us feel differently about things. Let, let me explain it in another way just quickly. Men primarily are deductive thinkers. Women, on the other hand, are inductive thinkers. Now, I knew this was true long before I realized that there was a biological explanation for this, that we do think differently this way. Now, this is an absolutely physical fact of life. When When a child is conceived in the womb, until the eighth week of conception or so, you can't tell what sex this child is going to be. I mean, they're, they look very similar, and, 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 and you just couldn't tell, is this going to be a male or female? Well, long about the eighth week or so, if, it, if, the, if the child is going to be a male child, the womb is going to be bathed with a, with a hormone called testosterone. Now, this does not happen with female babies. It only happens with male babies. And what testosterone literally does is it it retards the development of the connecting fibers between the right and the left hemisphere of the man's brain. So you ladies that have always said, my husband's brain damaged, now, 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 now you have some facts. Now you know why. So, so what, happens in, what happens in men, the result of that is that a man accesses the left hemisphere of his brain uh, naturally, uh, directly, and he, ha- and, he, and, he, and he accesses the right hemisphere of his brain indirectly. Now, I know you're looking and saying, what in the world does that mean? Well, all right. The left hemisphere, and I'm not trying to be a biology teacher up here, but, you, but, but picture the left hemisphere of your brain is, your, is called your cognitive domain. Now, when you hear that word cognitive, you think rational, real, uh, logical, uh, objective. You think, okay, the left side of my brain works like a computer, you know, and, and, and it makes men very good at math. You might wonder why do men seem to have a natural proclivity to be good at math, well, it's because that left hemisphere of their brain is the part that is logical, reasonable. Uh, not everybody, Brian, but, you know. <laughs> but the point being that that's the left hemisphere. Now, the right hemisphere of the brain is called the affective domain. 
And the affective do domain is the, is the sensitive side of your brain. It's the feeling side of your brain. It's the emotional side of your brain. It's the side of your brain that can understand things like love and, and romance. Now, keep in mind that it is this right-hand side of the brain that men access in a, in a, in a, in a less productive way than, than the left side. And this explains a lot of things, really. It explains a lot of things. It explains generally why men cry less than women because our emotions are one step removed from the direct process of the, of the way we think. It also explains why men can go and work beside somebody they hate for 20 years and never have a problem with it. You know how they do it? They just don't talk to the right side of their brain while they're at work. <laughs> now, we have to be able to do this I mean, notice how God is a genius because God created men to provide for their family, right? Well, if man has to go and provide for the family, that means man's going to have to be thrust out there into an environment where he may not like it or he may have to work with somebody he doesn't like. And, and, and you can't have emotions getting in the way of making a living and providing your family. And so God just gave men the natural right way to uh, work a work day and not get, get all bogged down with all the emotions of what's happening. Ladies, uh, this is why your husband can have a huge fight with you and go out and play 18 holes of golf. I know that infuriates you, doesn't it? <laughs> How can he do that? Simple. He just doesn't talk to the right side of his brain for 18 holes. And God created us to be differently. Now, now, women access both sides of the brain with equal ease and simultaneously. And this makes women a far better mother, far better homemaker. This helps mom understand the, the emotions of her home and the sensitivities of her children. Now, this creates all kind of differences in the, in, in the way we feel about things and the way we think about things. Man thinks primarily on the left side of his brain, A is greater than B, B is greater than C, therefore A is greater than C. Now, a woman can do that, but that's not usually how she thinks. A woman's brain works usually, okay, like that of a good detective, what, is it, what, does a good, good, de, what does a good detective do when he walks into a room? When a good detective walks into a room, she begins to scan the room. And as she begins to scan the room, she begins to look at hundreds of little bits of information. And as she, as she gathers these hundreds of bits of little information, how the light's shining, what the walls do, what the floors look like, who's there, what person is there, how does this room feel? Is it hot or cold? Or, I mean, and all of these hundreds of little clues come into hundreds of different categories that help her form a hunch that the butler did it. But, but, but God, when she walks into the room, she, it's like a radar dish is what it's like. You know? It's like a, a radar dish scanning the, the area, and she sees everything in there. Now, men, we did not get this radar dish. We have been cursed by God to walk through life with something akin to rabbit's ears with balls of tinfoil wrapped on the end. But anyway, her radar picks up thousands and hundreds of clues and senses that all go, go together to form a hunch. Now, she usually can't retrace how she came to this conclusion. And that really is a bother to us men because we get upset that somehow she's used all the wrong methods. I mean, according to us, you've used all the wrong methods, but she somehow has come to the right answer. Now, put this into a real-life situation. Show what I mean. Let's suppose, guys, that you and your wife are in that little room at an automobile dealership, and you're going to purchase a used automobile. And you're both sitting in there with the salesman, and the salesman, salesman gives you the pitch, and then he leaves the room so that you can discuss it. The man's usually going to speak first. The man usually says something like, well, honey, I, I, man, I'm telling you, this is a good deal. This is a good deal. We're going to get this car $400 below book value. It has new tires on it. It's got a great transmission. The warranty is wonderful. I think this is a good, good deal. And then she looks at him and she says, I don't like it. And then what does he say? Why don't you like it? 
And she just looks at him and she says, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I just don't like it. Now, a newly married man or a man that doesn't understand what I'm saying to you would look at her and say, that is so dumb. <laughs> but somebody I hope that you'll become who understands what's going on here and has some experience in life might look at that and say, this is very significant. We need to listen to what she says. Because this is what we call women's intuition. Women's intuition is not magic. It's not supernatural. Women's intuition is simply a, a, a satellite dish that picks up all of these clues coupled with uh, an inductive way of reasoning. And, and, and so... She gets these hundreds of clues, and, she, and, she, and they all run together, and they all work together, and she picked up something some, somehow in, in, in the discussion with the guy that's making the deal. She, she picked up something. Her, her radar dish picked up. Maybe this guy's not honest. Maybe, maybe, this guy, maybe this guy's shady. Maybe this guy's not telling us the truth. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but there's something about this guy that I just don't like, and I just don't trust him, and... And, and the point of that, this is that, that quite often her instincts are very reliable. And I'm just saying to you that God made us different on purpose because, frankly, we need both ways of thinking in order to make good decisions. We need cognitive thinking a is greater than B, B is greater than C, C, A is greater than C, like a computer thinks, cognitive, rational uh, type of thinking. And we need inductive thinking where lots of clues come together in order to get the correct answer. And God knows this, and this is why he put us together and made us different. We're not wrong, just different, yeah, yeah. Because each of these ways of thinking has their own strengths and weaknesses. Take the, let's take the inductive way of thinking first. The inductive way of thinking has one significant flaw. Let's say your wife is having a, a bad hair day. All of the clues that are coming in now have been filtered and colored by the fact that she's having a bad hair day. And let's just think, okay, uh, she's so concerned that her hair is frizzy today that, that, she, that she doesn't properly filter the information coming in and it gets all clouded by the fact that her emotions now have gotten all involved in, in, in all of these clues that are coming in. But to a man, two plus two equals four, it doesn't matter how your hair looks. But then the, then, the, then the deductive way of thinking that man has, has its own flaws. You know, the phrase in the computer industry is garbage in, garbage out. You know what that's talking about? It's talking about if you're working on a computer and you get one piece of information that you put in there wrong, everything else is going to be wrong. And so, men, when we think deductively, if we add the wrong number or have the wrong insight, then the whole thing is messed up. But women don't have that trouble because there may be like, you know, 100,000 clues that go into making up her uh, thought about this thing. And let's just say, okay, she gets 2,000 of them wrong. She still has 98,000 clues to help her get the right answer. So God created us differently by design so that we could have the greatness of both the inductive thinking and deductive thinking of life, the cognitive thinking and the effective thinking, it's not wrong, it, it, it's, it's just different. God created us by that way on purpose, by design. Let's look at another one real quick, the way we communicate. Yeah, helpmate, there you go. Perfect word for that, isn't it? God, so God created him a helpmate. Really, that helpmate word is a, is a little phrase. It means a helper that is fit for him. And that means suited in every way to meet his needs, and he can meet her needs. All right, let's look at another one. Let's look at the way we communicate. We're different in the area of the way we communicate. Communication is to a marriage what oil is to an engine. Are you familiar with engines? You're familiar with the fact that if they don't have any oil in them, they're going to do what? Seize up. Marriages that don't have good communication, guess what they're going to do? They're going to they're gonna seize up. 
Now, if you are ever going to have, have good communication in marriage, you're going to have to understand some things about the way men and women communicate. And you're going to have to learn to speak in terms that your mate can comprehend easily. Look, look at this passage. This is Ephesians 4. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. I know that may not, that one little single verse may not say everything that, that you need to hear, but what it's talking about is talking about how all of us who belong to the Lord need to speak to each other the truth, but we need to do it in a loving way. Now, this can be very difficult. It's a, it, it, it's, a good, it's a good rule for speaking to everyone. Tell them the truth, but be gentle about it. Put, sprinkle a little salt on it, you know. <laughs> be, be gentle, the truth in love. But this can be very difficult in a marriage because we don't understand that we don't speak the same language. In marriage, oh, we're speaking English most likely. I mean, most of us in here, there may be a few... A uh, few speakers that speak to each other in some other language besides, e besides English. And so when you speak English and she speaks English, you think you are understanding what each other's saying, right? Well, that's true. We speak the same language, but we broadcast on different frequencies. Let me just say, this, say it this way. Um, women speak in code. Guys, have you ever, have you ever noticed this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, men do not speak in code, ladies. Just so, just so you'll know, we do not speak in code. Now, that doesn't help one bit unless we can understand how to fix that. Let me, let me, share, let me share this principle with you. Uh, men generally state facts to convey information. When a man speaks, he's speaking facts to tell you information about what you just asked or what he wants you to know. Women often, this is not always true, but often state facts to convey feelings. This is where code comes from. This is where, this is where you have to read between the lines. I'll give you an example. You and your husband go out on a moonlit night. And the moon's beautiful and everything's great. And you step out of the automobile and you're walking up the little sidewalk and and, and, and the man looks up at the, at the moon and says, the moon is bright tonight. What is he saying? He's saying the moon is brighter than usual tonight. It's, it, it, it's, it's light out here. But let's suppose the woman says this. The woman says the moon is bright tonight. What is she saying? Well, she may be saying that it's brighter than usual tonight. But most likely what she's saying is, this moon makes me feel romantic. Now, if you're not perceptive enough to, to decode the message, you're going to probably say all the wrong things, and you're going to end up hurting her feelings. But ladies, now, now you, you have to be fair about it. Sometimes you hurt your own feelings. And sometimes you, but by, by reading something in code that was not transmitted in code. Uh, you, you and your husband go over to eat steaks one night with a, some friends of yours. And you sit down and you cut a little piece of that steak, put it in your mouth. And then you say to the man of the family, where'd you get these steaks? And he will say, Win dixie uh, Sam's, uh, Neighborhood Market, Rouse's, wherever you get your steaks. But what if you say that to the woman? Where'd you get these steaks? What's she going to say? Why? What's wrong with them? Because she read code into what you said, even though no code <laughs> was, was intended. Now, now, ladies, you'll not be surprised by this uh, for me to tell you that your man would be oblivious to a code, even if there was one in there. Now, now let me explain how this difference in communication styles can really wreak havoc in a marriage. Let's go back to our bright, bright, bright moon story. Man and woman get out of the car, walk up the sidewalk. Before they get to the door, the wife says, the wife says, the moon is bright tonight. What does she mean? She means, well, 
this moon tonight makes me feel romantic. But what does he hear? He hears the moon is brighter than usual tonight. So what does he say? He says, yes, and if I had known the moon was so bright tonight, I would have just prepared to cut the grass. <laughs> very innocent now, very innocent. He's agreeing. He thinks he's agreeing with her. He thinks, you said the moon is bright, and I'm saying, yes, it is bright. It's so bright that I would have planned to cut the grass tonight had I known the moon would be Very innocently, I'm agreeing with you. Everything's groovy. Everything's cool. But what does she hear? She hears, I would rather cut the grass than kiss you any day. So what does she say? Well, you're no Prince Charming either, bucko. <laughs> And then storms into the house, and he's standing out there like Charlie Brown, you know, and thinking, I don't even understand what I don't understand. I mean, now, now, now let's, just, let's just examine a second and, and, and see what would have fixed this, all right? Now, what would have fixed this? Would, one of two things would have fixed this right up. One, one is uh, the woman could have deciphered the code before she sent it. Like, she, she could have said, that moon makes me feel romantic. Now, any man can understand that, right? <laughs> no loss of communication there. Or, or the husband could have fixed the problem by saying, you know, sometime... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> I see you. The woman could have fixed, the man could have fixed the problem by saying, sometimes my wife states facts in order to convey feelings. She might be telling me that, that this moon makes her feel romantic. And then presto, you could have had communication, but you, in order to have proper communication, you have to understand that you don't speak on the same frequencies or else, you know, Wedlock's going to turn to headlock and headlock to deadlock. Uh, because God designed us differently. Uh, not wrong, just different. Just different, yeah. <laughs> yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Y'all want to look at one? Let's look at one or two more of them, huh? All right, let's look, let's look in the area of goals and relationship. We're different in the area of goals and relationship. Women love to relate to other people, to build deep relationships. Men, because they're left-brained, rational, cognitive, subjective, I mean objective, like a computer, because they're left-brained, they're, they're very goal-oriented, very achievement-oriented. Now, this difference exposes itself in many subtle ways. If we were at a college campus, and, and I observed this back long, many years ago, obviously I'm not at a college campus now, but I just noticed like, like the, the fact that women are relational and men are goal-oriented uh, exposes itself in, in lots of little subtle ways. And, and one of them is, if you were on a college campus, uh, you, you could watch uh, men and women walk around with books, and you would notice that a woman, the women would carry, generally carry their books up here like this. When they're carrying their books, they do like this like they would carry a baby because it's, it's a relational, it's a nurturing type of deal. Men carry books down here like this on a hip or a backpack. You know, I mean, they're, they're, it, it, you, you just notice the difference. Um, it comes in the way we give directions. Uh, if a man, if you had come to a man and you ask a man, how do I get to McDonald's? You men probably would say something like this. Well, you need, to, you need to go here to the edge of the parking lot, and you need to turn south on Mobile Street. Then when you turn south on, south on Mobile Street, you'll come to a stop sign, and that stop sign is St. Charles, and you need to turn west on St. Charles. You need to go up to the traffic light. Then you need to go south down Highway 49, and about 1,200 feet on your right, there will be McDonald's. That's how you would give direction, concept-oriented. 
If you ask a lady how to get down there, you probably get something like this. Well, you know, you go right up here to this, right up here to the edge of the parking lot. You know, there's that beauty salon that's right there on the edge. You know, that lady that works in that beauty salon, she's got a husband, been cheating on her all these years. I just feel so sorry for her. And then you go right down that little road and you come to stop sign. It's right there. That foot doctor's office is right down there. You know, that foot doctor has somebody. You know, he worked on Aunt uh, Susie's big toe and he would just. And then, and then you turn right, and you go up to this traffic light, and if you look right over there, there's this beautiful little jewelry shop. And that lady's been working in there a long time, and she's real sweet. And I, in other words, <laughs> women give directions generally based on relationships, where men give, uh, give directions based on concepts. I'll give you another one. I don't want to sound tacky about this, but this is. Uh, it, it shows up in the way we go to the restroom. Have any of you ever been out with a big group of people, ladies and men, out at some kind of a concert or something like that? All right, at some point along the way, what do the women do? One of the women stands up and says, announces to the group, do any of you sisters need to go to powder your nose? And the whole herd gets up (laughs) and they all go (laughs) to the restroom. About 45 minutes later, They all come back, and you say, what took you so long? And they say, well, there was a line. Well, I know you took it with you. (laughs) You'll never hear a man, you'll never hear a man do that. You know why? Because men have a goal. You know what the goal is? Get in there, get it done, get back as fast as we possibly can. Do you know, ladies, you, you, you don't know this because you probably, you've never been in a men's restroom, hopefully. Um, but you don't know, men, when men walk into a men's restroom, we don't even look at each other. Seriously, I mean, we'll walk in, there might be five or six men at different and various places in the sinks and the urinals and stuff, and, and I guarantee you, we'll walk in and we'll walk right straight. We just keep our eyes pointed straight ahead. We don't look to the left or the right, and we go right into the little urinal, and we always maintain a one urinal buffer. <laughs> between. It's very uncomfortable to have to go to one right beside somebody else, because then you got to really focus on keeping. <laughs> and we go get the job done, and, and, and we come out. <laughs> it shows up in the way we take trips. Uh, men have a goal. Men, men are goal-oriented. When we take a trip, we want to go where we're going and get there as fast as we can. And uh, we're not going to stop until we're going to put the pedal to the metal. We ain't stopping until we get there. So what do we do with our family? We tell our family, all right, I'm going to tell you what. Before we get in this car, you better get in that bathroom. If you need to go to that bathroom right now, you better get that. You better get some water if you want because we ain't stopping. And then about five minutes down the road, what's the first thing that happens? The first thing that happens is little Susie Now, little Susie says, Dad, I got to go to the bathroom. And what does Dad say? Dad says, I thought I told you to go to the bathroom before we left the house. Well, why does he care whether little Susie needs to go to the bathroom or not? Because he has a goal. Because his goal is to conquer this trip and do it faster. I'm telling you, we want to make a better time this time than we've ever made in our life. We got there in three hours and 39 minutes and 12 seconds, and brother, we're going to break the record today. I'm telling you, it's going. Yeah, it shows up in the way we live our life, goals and relationships. How many of you guys love to go to the mall? You just love to go to the mall just to look, I mean, hey, just to look around. You love to go to the mall just to look around. All right, I don't see any hands up. How many of you ladies like to go to the mall just to look around? Yeah, there you go. Why the difference? Well, the difference is because men don't shop. Men hunt. Women shop. Men hunt. When men want something from, a, from, a, from the mall, they know what they want. They know where it is. And they go and park, and they go right straight in the store, go right straight to where it is, and they get what they went after, and they pay for it, and they get back in their vehicle, and they're gone home. Mission accomplished. I don't know. Yeah, right. I don't know about you guys, but it makes me so angry when I don't get what I go after. It's like the prey has escaped. You know. I mean, yeah. 
But ladies go and they look and they, and, and listen, it frustrates men not to have a goal. So let me tell you something. Yeah, I know. I, uh, uh, we, let me tell you how to handle this. When you go in, if you want your husband to go with you, as soon as you get out of the automobile, here's what you do. Tell him, all right, here's what we're looking for. And give him a goal. Say, all right, I'm looking for a white blouse with blue, with blue, with a blue collar and button up and so forth. I, I like for it to cost, I like for it to be on sale. All right, that gives him a goal. That gives him, and I'm telling you what, he will be the greatest bird dog that you have ever seen. <laughs> He will go to in the store and he will find every rack of white blouses with blue on them. And he'll find all the colors. He'll come back and say, you know what I found? I found, all right, there's one over there. It's 20, like twenty-one ninety-five, and there's one over there, 13. And this one right here, this one's on sale for 20% off. That one. And, and, and you've given him a goal and, and he'll enjoy the trip or as much as possible. He'll, he'll, en he'll enjoy the trip. You can help him by giving him a goal. And let me, let me just say one other thing about this. Um, when you go to the mall... If you're worried about him looking at other people while you're at the mall, have any of you, I mean, I don't want you to raise your hand because I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but have you ever done that? Have you ever, have you ever noticed, if you ever noticed, you think, oh, uh, uh, he's checking these women out. Well, let me just ease your mind one minute, okay? If he's at the mall with you and he's looking at these, and he's down there just looking at the mall with you, you don't have to worry about him looking at anybody else. He loves you or else he wouldn't be there. <laughs> that is the essence of love right there. He will be with you forever because <laughs> he loves you. He loves you. Let me give you one more just real quick. We're different in the area of spiritual receptivity. We read in, in the first message, I read you this passage out of 1 Peter that says, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives, treat her with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. And if you don't treat her the way you should, your prayers aren't going to be heard. Now, what this verse says is, it says that we are equal partners in the, in the gift of new life. That means that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It means at the foot of the cross, there's no male and there's no female. They're just redeemed sinners. And so in the area of spiritual receptivity, I think most of us would probably agree and have seen this so many times that when you have men and women in a group and you're sharing the gospel or you're sharing the word of God, that women, generally speaking, are going to be more receptive to that message than men are. As a matter of fact, in most churches, now this is not true of our church. I mean, this is really unusual because our church really, we, we have many, many men, but in most churches, most churches are filled with about 75% of the people there are women. And if you preach the gospel, you would expect the woman to be the first one to come down the aisle and receive Christ. And why is that? Well, it probably has something to do with that, with that right side brain, that affective, that sensitive side of the brain that when you ladies hear the gospel, you sense that it's real. You sense that it's something you need. You sense that Christ is, has provided it for you and that you want it. And it doesn't take you very long to make that decision to give yourself to Christ. He's trustworthy. He's loyal. You can trust what he says. Now, guys, on the other hand, because we're left brain oriented, we lots of times like to hide behind the left brain. By that, I'm talking that we, we want more facts. We, 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 we need more information to make our decision. It's like, okay, uh, I, I don't have enough. I don't have enough info here to make a choice. And when I get a little bit more info, then I'll make a choice. And I'm just going to say to you simply that don't don't hide. But if it, look, if you need more information, great. Then that's fine. If you need to, more facts to make a decision, and you that's what you really need, that's fine. Because if you're being honest with yourself, 
and you're being truthful about what you need, that's fine. It's okay to get all the facts because I'm going to tell you what, the, dig, the more you dig with Christ, the more facts you're going to find, the more you're going to see how true he is and how real it is. As a matter of fact, a couple of the greatest apologists that have ever existed on this earth are uh, C.S. Lewis, and I know you've heard that and uh, heard his name before, and Josh McDowell. And both of those guys were one to the Lord Guess what they were doing, both of them. Both of them were atheists, and both of them set out to prove that the cross and the resurrection never happened. And in all of their study and all of their work in trying to prove that the cross, that, that the resurrection from the dead never happened, they, came, they found the information. They came to the Lord, and they became some of the greatest Christian writers uh, to defend that in, in the history of the world. And I'm just saying, Christ... We'll answer all your questions, and he's all you need. But don't go to hell and miss heaven, hiding behind that left side of your brain, pretending that you don't have enough facts. I mean, if you got the truth, I'm just saying, look, stand up. I'm saying, make a choice. Make a commitment. I mean, you heard the truth. You know the truth. You've seen the truth. You've heard testimonies of the truth. You've watched the truth. You've lived the truth. You've seen the truth live before you. Stand up and make a choice. And be the spiritual leader that your family needs and is designed to have. Because God really does hold us responsible, guys. Now, I know that you say, well, I'm not Jesus and I can't be perfect. Well, nobody said you are and I know you can't be perfect. And so does God. But he expects you to do everything you can to be the kind of leader that your family needs. Step up to the plate. Hey, man, when you get the facts, step up to the plate. Hit one out for your family. Get in the game. Make a choice. Stand for Christ. All right, would you please stand to your feet?